following episode, I was really pleased to have my good friend, Harry Indio Ramkishan, who I know as Indio. Indio is a talented writer, director, cinematographer, as well as the co-founder of the Bronx Filmmakers Collective. He's a renaissance man in many ways. It was a great conversation. However, I think it's important to note that the conversation was from a little over a month ago. And the reason that this was delayed was because Indio, he was doing a lot of work and traveling and we wanted to time the release of this with the release of his new podcast, which is called The Scene and Take Podcast, which is now available on iTunes and Spotify. So it was a great conversation, but I did want to just preface the conversation with a little bit about what's going on. So recently there was an article headline from Quartz Magazine the coronavirus is already pushing an already vulnerable film industry closer to the edge. Now, that was written on March 9th, which was eight days ago. According to the numbers at that time, and I think that the estimations would be a lot higher right now, but the worldwide film industry has lost over $5 billion. Now, theaters around the world are shutting down to try to contain the spread of the virus. AMC, the largest theater chain in the U.S., with roughly 630 locations and around 11,000 screens, made its announcement last night that they're basically closing for at least 6 to 12 weeks. Now, a lot of other theater chains are announcing the same thing. Just imagine the economic impact on the film industry and what's going to happen. I've been speaking with a lot of friends of mine that are in different facets of the industry who are currently at home because productions have shut down. Not just directors, producers, and writers, but also union grips and gaffers. It's impacted all of us. I do believe this crisis will pass eventually. The question mark is just how long. Um, So I just want to wish you well, your families, your loved ones, your colleagues. Just stay safe. Wash those hands. Don't fight each other over toilet paper. And enjoy this great conversation that I had with my good friend, Harry Indio Ramkishan. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the Film Scene Podcast with your host, Zef. All right. I'm so pleased to have my friend and fellow Bronx filmmaker, Harry Indio Ramkishan. And I know him as Indio. Welcome, Indio. Thank you, man. And uh, thanks for having me down, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate you coming through. How's uh, your 2020 treating you so far? It's going quick. Yeah, it is going going quick. quick. It's already February. It's It's already the middle of February. We're we're already in February. And, you know, uh, it was, it feels like yesterday when, you know, the ball was dropping. And then now it's just like, wow, we're in February. I'm gearing up to start my traveling because I do um, sports and I travel with a car racing circuit. So uh, starting in March for a weekend a month, I'll be out across the country covering that. Fantastic. So, and yeah. so you're doing cinematography? You're, you're going to be in a DP on? That? Yeah, I, I, I do both um, because we do the live broadcast as well. And I'm usually in the pit. So I'm with a gimbal and I'm getting the action, the, the tire changes, the crew just oh, going back it, and yeah. forth. And Exciting. then we we do the sit down interviews with the drivers. We kind of get that, uh, that color that you want to see. And it broadcasts on CBS Sports Network tape delayed but we get it up there and also for the the circuit itself sro they do a, like a package for the end of the year so that they you know put all the visuals together how much of a delay is it usually usually uh it could be as quick as a few days yeah. uh and max like a week okay that's yeah. not too bad yeah. yeah so uh what else has been going on creatively on your side well as you know i'm the co-founder of the bronx filmmakers collective so we are always looking to try to get our membership, you know, going, and that includes myself, right? So I have been writing, uh, not as much as I would like to, but I've been writing some scripts. I've had this one feature script that I've been working on for quite some time, and it's a coming-of-age story. It takes place in the Bronx. Uh, a little bit of my life fictionalized, you know, some of those moments that you remember as a kid in high school. And so I've been working on that, and it's been taking a while. But I do have a short that I would like to film this summer, so I got to really get cranking on it. And again, because time is flying, I have to get my pre-production really in order. And it's about a young boy who's hawking waters at Yankee Stadium to help his grandmother pay for her medicine. 
Fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those stories where oftentimes we see kids having to do things that adults um, have to deal with. But, you know, in in their caring hearts, they try to do as much as they can, any way they can to be able to provide for their family. And in this case, it's Abuelita, uh, grandmother that is, you know, has some conditions that she needs to get medicines and can't really afford it. So it's a short film and perhaps it can, it can grow to be something different. But uh, right now I just wrote it as a short. I think that's a fantastic premise of the story and very, very relatable to a lot of families. Yeah. I mean, you, and we see that a lot in New York, right? We, we grew yeah. up, you know, riding the train, doing things that a lot of kids don't do because one, they don't have that kind of infrastructure and two, you have working parents and now, and so there's a lot of independency going on with kids. But then oftentimes, like I've had friends who, as the like older child, basically was parenting the youngest sibling. Sure. And so those are the stories that I like to tell because I think people relate to them even more. Um, and although I haven't written and directed my own short in quite some time, uh, this is going to be one of those that I really want to take my time with and, and be able to tell the story in a, in a, in a good way. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm wishing it upon the universe to, to help me go through all of the channels that I need to. Cause obviously I want to use, I want to be right in the plaza by Yankee stadium. Yeah. I want, I want to be able to wear the, the Yankee fitted, you know, sure. so that's I, how it all starts. Yeah, I, yeah. That's my philosophy about any film that you have to will these things into existence yeah, because man. it's so, it's so difficult getting it through that. It, that first step of willing it in your mind, uh, that's, that's one of the most important steps. Absolutely. Your word is your wand, man. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a book actually, so I'm oh, not yeah. going to take credit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah. think there's a book yeah, called like your that. word is your wand, which yeah. is true. You know, you, yeah. you want to be able to utilize your words to be able to manifest what it, it is that you want to do. Excellent. So have you seen any good films lately in general? I mean, we're going to, we're going to talk about specific scenes in a bit, but just, yeah. I guess in the last year, any, any breakout films of 2019 that you wanted to sort sort of talk about? You know, in 2019, there are, I have a 13 year old. So a lot of the films I go to has to be, you know, <laughs> the <laughs> films that we could watch together, but totally understand. I, I do get to sneak out uh, by myself every now and again, when it's a, it's an R rated movie that I want to check out. And last year, obviously the, one of the biggest one, was Joker. Yeah. And Joaquin Phoenix. This movie, I really didn't go at it uh, with any expectation. I was trying to stay away from all of the reaction videos. I'm the same way. You know? I I don't like to know too much. I don't like to see too much footage. I don't like to read it. Because it really, I find it an odd way to sort of perceive a movie. Because then you're already going in with the intent of, hey, well, let me see what everybody else thinks. It's almost like a lazy (laughs) approach or just like a, a cattle like approach to uh, enjoying cinema yeah. because you're like, Hey, I don't want to form my own opinion just yet. Let me, let me see what everybody else's opinion is. And then, you know, already go in there with an opinion. Right. And I see that a lot. I don't know if it, if it's a newer trend, I think it's, it's more like that nowadays because of the internet where like you're just blitzed with, Oh, I already know that film to a point where sometimes people don't even watch a lot of things because it's like, Oh, well, I already know what that's all about. You right. know? So, well, you haven't really experienced it until you actually watched it. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's what, you know, we would have talked about when talking about the trailers and how these things have really taken on a life of its, its own. And a lot of people are looking to, whether or not they want to go to the trailer to see what the movie is about or just go into the theater without having seen anything, which is almost an impossibility nowadays, and just have an open mind, no expectations, and watch what they're going to Yeah. What they think yeah. they're going to see. That's how exactly I like to yeah. enjoy it. Jo- same, same thing with, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but Joker was one of those movies where there was so much hype. You just knew that uh, because of the IP, right, it's DC, right, and, um, but the fact that DCU has always had some difficulties as compared to obviously the MCU and Marvel. So in knowing that the Joker was coming out with a new person at the helm, uh, 
um, you know, because we always remember Heath Ledger and, and, and the great job that he did as the Joker and the fact that they were going to take it a different way. It To me, it didn't feel like a superhero movie. It didn't feel like a typical DCEU movie where you have like Batman or something like that. This was more of a story about someone who was going through things. Yeah, I agree completely. Right. Well said. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the, the films that I went in not having uh, or not trying to have too much expectations in what I had heard, you know, all the rumblings about it. The one thing that I did want to see is how they rocked the now famously <laughs> uh, location of the stairs. And, yes. And it was it's filmed in the Bronx. And I actually have a couple friends that live nearby there. So I had heard from him all the talks about the people coming up and all that stuff. So yeah. the neighborhood was was catching feelings about that, right? So I just wanted to see how how they, you know, did sure. it and stuff like it, that. It's, um, I'm, so I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned the stairs because as a fellow Bronx guy, I... You know, I, I've traveled and, like, seen those stairs growing up, and I always thought, oh, man, I would love to, you know, you know, he, <laughs> Todd Phillips beat me to the punch. You know, I should have I used those stairs, but I always thought how cinematic looking those stairs were, you know, so it's kind of cool to actually now see them one of the beauties that uh our borough has right the the stairs because we're we're we have so much elevation in the bronx and you know being the only borough uh in new york city that's connected to the contiguous united states everywhere else is an island uh we have some elevation so we're not flat and sometimes you have to use some stairs to get from block to block (laughs) Uh, that's the shortcut right i remember a couple movies that had stairs of the Bronx and there wasn't the hype that there is now because obviously social media and all this stuff before, but I remember, you know, quite as kept, I'm always going to support Bronx site. So I watched made in Manhattan with J Lo. Yeah. And I remember the stairs that she used to walk up from her apartment on the, on the movie. And it was actually just North of where I grew up. So I knew the stairs and I knew them well. And I was like, Oh snap. But then, with movie magic, you know, you pop up somewhere and then you end up somewhere else, Absolutely. right? And I was like, okay, there's not continuity of real life here, the, the location, but that was cool seeing the, the stairs. And it was like, oh, that's up the block. Yeah. So I'm really uh, ecstatic when I see my home and, and and I saw, you know, the train stations and stuff like that. Plus there was a lot of, on IG, there was a lot of behind the scenes images. So I think one of the set photographers would take some plates of the stairwell and then hold up a card with the actual scene in it with the Joker. So it was pretty cool to see the the superimposed image of the Joker at the stairs. Um, and those things I, I get hype about always when I see something that I'm familiar with, especially where yes, I grew up. Totally. Yeah. So I filmed, as you know, cause you were part of the production, uh, yeah, India was gracious <laughs> enough to uh, <laughs> popped up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, pop up as one of the poker players in my movie <laughs> The Trouble. But a lot of the reason that I we filmed it in the Bronx was to depict uh, that area, the South Bronx, in a way that you don't typically see in films. You know, right, right. Yeah, I mean, and you know, we we were there, uh, and when I say we, the Bronx Filmmakers Collective, we we, we were there from the beginning when. Zeph was saying, hey, I got I got this story that I want to do. It's like it's, it's an urban western. We was like, cool. And to have gone to set uh, for one of the um, the days and shoot a little bit of BTS, because I also had did a little documentary uh, on your process and, and what you was doing, uh, this little series I had, uh, The Bronx Focused. Came out great. So yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, thank you. And we had we had fun doing it and yeah to, to be able to i don't even play poker but you know i, I faked it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about pretending yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about pretending yeah you sold it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well I, I don't think I, I got a sliver in it you know i gotta talk to the editor I should have yeah right yeah yeah talk to christina Nicole. <laughs> yeah. yeah christina what happened you know you ain't want indio's face up in there yeah um so yeah, actually, definitely a shout out to the Bronx Filmmakers Collective for yeah, yeah, definitely. for supporting the film in so many ways. And we were glad to do it, man. And that's that's one of the great things about the Bronx Filmmakers Collective. And 
So, um, yes, sir. I think it's come a long way over the years too, as an organization. Yeah, and we only get better with our with our membership. You know, I mean, you're doing big things now, and just don't forget the little people when, <laughs> when you're out there in Hollywood. No, man, I'm still independent. <laughs> still very much an indie filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, and you know, sometimes uh, independent filmmaking. There is something liberating about that, right? Because you do have uh, an amount of freedom that you don't necessarily get with even mid, I will, I will call them I'm, I'm akin to, to basketball, mid-major studios where sure. you, know, you have your deadlines, you have your budgets, you have all that stuff. And, while and you have rounds of notes. Yes, yes. From I, many people. <laughs> many people. Yeah. And, and sometimes people that don't need to be in the room. But yeah. uh, everybody has to chime in, right? I'm glad that I haven't had uh, to to be able to go through that, at least in the creative narrative filmmaking side. I do have that, you know, with broadcast stuff. But again, you know, at least you have just a on location producer that you just really have to tune into and, and, and let all the other noise just fall off. So I will say for people that are outside of the industry, when they hear filmmakers, that are, you know, top level filmmakers, it's like, oh, this is so annoying that I'm getting, you know, these sort of notes and it's filmmaking by committee. And, you know, sometimes w before you're making films, it could be like, what are these people talking about? Right. Um, they're getting a chance to make films. But when you're actually doing things and I've had more experience on this side in the corporate world when you're doing, you know, let's say branded content kind of pieces and then when you're getting rounds and rounds of notes and this thing that you had a creative vision for, you know, and it just gets, it gets sort of diluted from each round of notes that you have to adhere to these people. Then you feel that frustration. You're like, Oh, now I get what people are talking about. It's like really like it's, it's actually hurt the, the original thing that it was supposed to be. It's no longer that thing. It's something very different and oftentimes worse you know, by many rounds of notes from many different people. And it's done, like, you know, this creative process by committee, which sometimes could, could work. All right. Filmmaking is a collaborative medium. And I love the fact that it's a collaborative medium. But when there's the politicking going on of people that are above you or they, you know, they want to pull rank or, you know, it's not necessarily a good idea, but it's their idea. And there's that sort of thing going on. That's, I think, when it could be hurtful to the creative process. Absolutely. And then we already know, uh, you and I as filmmakers, that oftentimes there's three versions of a story. The one you write, the one you shoot, and the one you edit. And sometimes when it's a bigger production, the one that has been edited is the one the studio wants and not what the director wants. So then they, there's a fourth story involved. Yeah. So... In between all of those, you have the, the notes and you have the hiccups in production. In independent filmmaking, we have hiccups all the time. A location doesn't uh, happen or an actor bails out because, you know, they're not getting... <laughs> right, right. Uh, They're not getting the, the money that they want or an opportunity shows up and they take it elsewhere or something like that because oftentimes we... Are you know if it's a after a, a S, S A G you know uh, person, a SAG actor, then obviously we have a contract and and things are pretty much there. But sometimes we go the non union route as independent filmmakers when we want to try to do something on in on our own budget. So sometimes there's difficulties there. I mean, I remember being a DOP on a project where the lead actress. Uh, unfortunately had a passing in, in the family and had to leave out the country, but then made that the excuse not to be on the project at all. We were going to postpone it. Right. But then she decided like, you know what? I don't want to do it now. And we already had everything planned yeah. out and we were just going to postpone it. Luckily we had, a location that was a home of one of the actresses because that's how you have to work it, right? You have to hustle and try to get things. But yeah, she and just it happened. It. That happens even on the most major. I was just yeah. reading that that same exact scenario happened on the movie The Gentleman. Really? With uh, oh, Matthew wow. McConaughey, the Guy Ritchie movie. That yeah. Kate Beckinsale was cast as uh, 
one of the leads guy, uh, Matthew McConaughey's wife in the film, two weeks into shooting, she said, oh, I had uh, like, like a passing of somebody in my family and, and there's just a whole bunch of other stuff going on. I, I can't be in, in the production. Now, that was wow. her public statement, so who, who wow. knows what was going on right. behind the scenes. Maybe but that's contractual could be issues, anything, but yeah. to me, that sounds crazy that's after two weeks. Super fishy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They were in production two weeks, and then she bailed. In production two weeks, wow. and then she bailed out. Yeah. That sounds intense. Well, look at that. Yeah. So even at the highest level, we have that kind of situation going on. So yeah. it is one of those difficult things that we go through as filmmakers, the behind-the-scenes stuff. So um, I often don't – I'm never going to hate on, on on a filmmaker trying to do their work, right? Same. And because you know that process, you know how, how difficult it is. Even um, making a bad film is so difficult. <laughs> so when I, so that's why I'm not quick to, you know, you know, you're a little bit more empathetic. I see absolutely. kids that are starting out because I work with a lot of film students that right. I'm mentoring and, you know, sometimes they could be harshly critical. I'm like, Hey, you know, you know, I have opinions too, but I think you're going to have different opinions once you're really into the process of, you know, how these things go. Right. And at the end of the day is art and art is subjective. And sometimes the execution isn't what we necessarily uh, can do in our, in our own projects. So when I see somebody else, uh, maybe perhaps fall a little short or whatever, it happens, but done is better than perfect. Yes. And there's no perfect project. Right, right. There's there's some that have been closed, but there's yeah. never a perfect project. Yeah. And I agree with you. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned subjectivity because that's a subject that um, I wanted to discuss. And, um, you know, I always used to joke around when I was making The Trouble and when we released it. I'm like, hey, we're not making Pepsi. We're making Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Uh, it's not it's not for everybody you know we already know it's not going to be for everybody we know that it's already going to be you know a little bit niche you know it's like more people like pepsi than like dr pepper but the people that like dr pepper they love dr pepper so that to me was the kind of movie we were trying to make yeah no absolutely and you know you hear the word cult following uh or the phrase cult following right and oftentimes it happens because there are just a small group of passionate people about a particular project and liking something is subjective as yes. is a movie. Right. So there's movies that I've seen and watched and love that you may not necessarily like and love. Right. But that's okay. Exactly. You know, we, we each come in with a different thing that gets us, you know, and Sometimes we forget that, and especially now with social media, there's a lot of critics out there, and I, and I throw yeah. it in air quotes, right? right. Um, that they're, they're coming in with uh, subjectivity to it, as you should when you want to have an opinion. When you want to dis- discern taste. Right. But it's often coming from your own internal, like all of the prerequisites you have in your mind and in, you know, whatever formed to who you are and there's something that you may glaringly miss out the whole situation just because something happened in your past so like in terms right. of like sub if there's a subject matter that you know you just disagree with from the jump you're not going in there let me see how the story gets told you know if true um you're a, a, a person that is super technical and i've seen a whole bunch <laughs> of you know, space movies and things like that. And uh, some people go in and be like, oh, well, this could have happened in space and because this and that and that. I was like, well, yeah, we get it, you know. But <laughs> again, it's a movie. Right, it's a know? movie. That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. So uh, I guess the first thing I'm thinking of is Interstellar, <laughs> which is a fantastic film, <laughs> right? you know. But yeah, clearly there was some exactly. dramatic license. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, you have to give them that. I mean, yeah. because nobody has experienced any of that the martian is my example <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> with the the martian uh and i love the movie but 90 percent of what happened in that movie could not have happened could not have happened so <laughs> it's like yeah if it could that's awesome yeah but, yeah yeah so, so that that's a good point because i think that's kind of what i was trying to say before is i think it's completely valid to have likes and dislikes and, and even strong opinions 
But I think sometimes what I see is when people sort of rip something to shreds, it's, it's one thing to not like it, but I, sometimes I see people ripping certain things to shreds just because it's not part of their taste. And I think that to me could be a little heavy handed. And nowadays you see a lot of that, especially because ev- everybody could be a critic yeah. online. And, and I think actually in general, I was having this conversation recently with a friend of mine that I think film critics in general have a tough job because me and you, if we like a movie, we could say, Hey, we like that movie. There's not this sort of pressure to, we have to justify why we like the film critics. A lot of times they have to justify, it's easier for them to not like the film than to justify why they like the film. Cause then their peers are looking at them. You know, they're, part of this intellectual bracket of society so if they if it's something that's not considered high brow they're gonna rip it apart i was i was surprised honestly that uncut gems was not nominated for for more stuff and and kind of got dissed at the oscars right I, d- I, didn't, I didn't see it yet uh but that's that's the general consensus on it i mean again one of those things where you you see the trailer and you're like wow this is pretty crazy premise and then adam sandler in this dramatic role, and I could see where the voting members of the Academy have looked at it and said, this is a comedian. He's done a whole bunch of bad movies. This this dude was Bobby Boucher. I'm not going to give him the time of day. Even without, Which, yeah, without looking at it. That's such a bad it. way of yeah, thinking. Absolutely. Yeah, you're probably right. You same, know? same with J-Lo. Yeah. Same with yeah. J-Lo. I didn't see Hustlers. I didn't see Hustlers but, yet. I definitely, yeah. it's definitely on my list of films to watch because I've heard great things and I heard the script is fantastic. Right. Uh, I did see The Farewell. That was another movie that, that was fantastic. Yeah. It was amazing. So I think that should have been nominated for, you know, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, you you get into the political arena of it all. Um, yeah. There there was the situation with, when, when Moonlighting won, right? Um, Moonlight? Yeah, Moonlight. Yeah. Um, Thinking of, of the ABC show, more right, right, with Bruce <laughs> Willis and Simple Shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to our yeah. <laughs> reveals our age. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Moonlight when it won, then after everything that happened because of the Ryan Gosling movie um, and the and the faux pas there, but the fact that some people, after the fact, admitted that they voted for Moonlight without having seen it, it it it. it cast a shadow on it as well sure and but that's that's not the first time it's happened yeah. and it won't be the last yeah you have a situation where this year best director category good movies i haven't seen all of them but all male and you've had some movies out at least past this past year where there were some female directors that should have been nominated as well at least put into the conversation of it all and you don't have that. And, you know, let's not talk about the diversity uh, in, in terms of people of color and, and women, too. But it's just so political that oftentimes I wish there was like the people's choice where it had more oomph than, you know, something that not, not quite more than the Academy, but that it, it like the SAG Awards, where's your peers or whatever. But even still, again, yeah, people just check boxes and keep it moving there it seems it seems like there's a lot of overlap a lot of the yeah you know like the the academy awards sort of mirrors the golden globes in a lot of ways and you know they it seems like right which is international press right right but either way it seems it seems like there's still a lot of the same sort yeah. of films that uh get nominated or win both and a lot of it is part of the marketing budget <laughs> yeah. where the studios are going to just market it. You know, we, how many trailers did we see of movies that were about to be nominated for your consideration, for your consideration? Sure. It, it's, it's, it's that game, but more power to you. If, if, you know, you want to do that because it does. I remember <laughs> Jimmy Fox famously saying once he won the Academy award, he was no longer Jamie Foxx. He was Mr. Fox. Interesting. So he, he said the weight of that award was much more than 
its the actual hit. physical <laughs> weight. You know, he, <laughs> yeah. he was like, this, this catapulted me. He was like, it was like, what's up, Jamie? No, it wasn't on what's up, Jamie. It was like, how you doing, Mr. Fox? <laughs> <laughs> so he knew that it was, something was different. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Makes sense. Uh, it's interesting. Awards in general for films are a funny thing, right? Because it's not the Olympics. It's not like, all right, this runner ran faster than this one, and we can measure it in in a very specific and objective way. The whole thing is subjective. It ties into this thing of subjectivity. It's like, hey, what does society, what do voting members consider the thing that should be the best? And a lot of times they are. They're, a lot of times they're, they're films... If it's not the best film, at least a film worth watching. A lot of times it is, you know. Um, but sometimes these things slip through the cracks because it is so subjective. So just because films aren't nominated for best picture doesn't mean that there's not a lot of outstanding pictures that are out there both here in the U.S. and also internationally. I'm personally happy to see people kind of branching out with international cinema a little bit more. I think Parasite is a breakout film, did great numbers here in the U.S., um, right. I think $32 million in the box office, which is outstanding for a film that w was subtitled. So I think that's a good sign that people are sort of branching out with their cinematic tastes. You know, Yeah, if there's one thing that your listeners take from this podcast <laughs> is seek out international films. South Korean films are phenomenal. And and you yeah. may have seen some. Absolutely. Watch the original old boy and not the American version. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there's so many great films coming out of uh, international areas. Um, South Korea. I mean, European movies. I love the pacing is different uh, than what we used to. Oftentimes, it's a little more drawn out. It's a little more character driven at times. Yes, Absolutely. You get a lot more character development there, and sometimes you wanna your 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 thumb is twitching if you're watching Netflix to to, to forward a little bit, but um, there are great stories there that you may want to watch. So just go out there. Maybe we we'll, we can put some recommendations because uh, I'm I'm blanking out on some of some of mine. Um, Man, right I now. I've seen so many because I I had the privilege of attending Can. Yes, uh, yeah. along with my producer George Rudai, who we were out there in May right. um, doing business for our movie, but then we got a chance to see a lot of great films, and it, it was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was just outstanding. There were so so many films that we saw that you know just blew us away. Yeah, I think generally speaking, too, there are some markets that are a little more willing to see uh, or to put out things that are a little more out the box than what we're used to. Um, yeah. You know, storylines um, that are kind of a little too squeamish for American market get told in international markets, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. And, uh, yeah, sometimes you're, you're, you're absolutely right about the pacing. Sometimes there is a different pace to certain films. Korean films, a lot of South Korean films – could be pretty fast paced though. Um, yeah, there's some action ones that are yeah. crazy too. Like the sequences that they do within a f two minute period can be just eye popping. You know, I like, saw this movie out there called uh, The the Cop, the Gangster, and the Devil. Okay. And that was amazing. Was it? It was, yeah. And it was based off a true story apparently. It took place like in the early 2000s about this cop. And sort of this rival gangster, who, you know, he's been trying to bust this guy and they, they just hate each other's guts. But they team up um, to try to catch this serial killer that's on the loose in South Korea. Okay. And it was, it was amazing. Now, do you find uh, when you're watching a movie that is not in your native language, obviously, that... Are your eyes kind of concentrating on the subtitles or are you just watching the action? Hmm. That's a good, great question. Cause I don't really think about, it. I have to, I guess I'd have to consciously think about that. I think I'm just sort of, t I'm trying to take in both as much as possible, but I think if you watch enough foreign films, it, it doesn't even feel like a thing. Let me, I just want to wait for this sirens yeah, yeah. to pass by. 
in New York City. You always yeah. got. You could be on the fiftieth floor, I swear, and you can hear police siren. So, I, so, so I have a funny story about this in general because when I was when I was younger and I didn't watch too many foreign films, I just wasn't exposed to them, and you know, didn't have my taste wasn't as evolved yet at that time. I was one of the first people, at least in my block on in the Bronx, to get a plasma TV, and this was in two thousand four. And at the time, plasma TVs, they were very expensive. They were very heavy, first of all. Yes. <laughs> and those were bricks. Yeah. I had to buy it somewhere in Brooklyn. Um, and the speakers, I'd ordered the speakers. I, w- I remember ordering some Yamaha speakers, but the TV didn't have built-in speakers. So I had to wait a few weeks for the speakers to come in. And um, my friend, Joel Martinez, shout out to Joel, who's also was our executive producer, um, at the time, he was going to film school, and he lived upstairs for me. And he had a DVD of of the movie City of God, mm. and so he put me onto that movie. Great movie. And I, he had given it to me to lend. He's like, "Oh, you have to see this movie." So I just threw it on my TV, um, just to test the TV, to like watch it without sound, just to make sure that the picture worked and it was calibrating the picture mm-hmm. in that movie blew me away i ended up sitting down in my living room that was barely furnished because it was like sort of a new place and just like sitting down on the floor and watching this movie um without sound from beginning to end and i would sort of watch it over and over again like i didn't watch it just one time i kept what that was like the only thing i watched for a few weeks until those speakers came and that was my first real exposure to a foreign film and after that i was just hooked so it kind of, I was seeing the visuals and, and reading the subtitles because I was not taking in the sound. So I think that maybe my theory is because you're not listening to the language and you're not, your ears aren't trying to hear what the words are saying, you could, I think maybe, at least for me, my eyes could be quicker at seeing the subtitles and seeing the action simultaneously without you know so i'm i'm getting more of the visual information all right. at once with with both things yeah so just in case folks don't remember or know about city of god it's a brazilian film it was actually brazil's i'm reading up uh brazil's first entry into the academy award for best foreign language film back in 2004 and had a young alice braga which you may know in, in many other films now but I was there with you in that when I saw this film, one, it it was it takes place in the favelas of Brazil, which are, is essentially the hood and, and, and areas like that. So in a certain way, you can kind of, uh, at least for me, relate to the to storylines in that they were here. They were like kids, which I didn't run in, in crazy circles, thankfully, but. You know, around the block, you had, you know, kids that were fending for themselves in a way like these kids in City of God were fending for themselves. And the environment being so, uh, not not to say bad, but so different that you had to adapt almost on a daily basis in order to survive figuratively and literally. Yeah. And... One of those things where, I don't know, for some reason, I guess because I am bilingual in the Spanish, I had a little more help with the words in Portuguese. So, like you, I wasn't really eyeing all of the the subtitles. But the action, right, because it it did get nominated for Best Cinematography. You can just see it in in the expressions and and the movement of the film. Um, So you didn't really have to, like, just keep your eyes on the lower third of the of the screen to see like what they're saying or whatever you saw it in their faces you saw it in the action so that was yeah that's a really good example city of god i actually want to go back and see it now yeah yeah you know? it makes me want to see it again just talking about it because yeah, it's such a great film yeah some movies right you, you it, they pop up out of nowhere and then you're like you know what i gotta sit down and see it again because now you're looking at it from a whole new set of eyes it's been some some time and it's kind of been like class. I actually saw recently that um, since it's been a while, th- they had like a reunion of the of the cast and stuff like that. Nice. And a lot of the cast were 
actual kids from the favela. They, wow. they weren't actors. Yeah. A few of them were sprinkled in there. But for the most part, the uh, directors, because it was co-directed, uh, they were using kids from the hood. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Great film. Yeah. For absolutely. anybody that hasn't seen it, definitely a must-watch film. Yep. You know. Good recommendation, City of God. Yeah. 2002 Brazilian crime film. So, so this ties into... I want to segue into our next segment where I want to ask you, Indio, what are a couple of your favorite scenes or noteworthy scenes that from any movie of, of any era um, that you, you'd want to discuss? You know, So one of the scenes, and it was very easy for me because it got me, it, it got the juices percolating for filmmaking uh, back in the day. And that was... Raiders of the Lost Ark, the opening sequence. Uh, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas. Great film. Great film. I mean, that holds up so well, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can watch yeah. it today, and it's absolutely. still just as exciting. Indiana Jones, and, and the fact that, you know, a lot because how I grew up and being Guyanese and Puerto Rican and growing up being Indio since I was uh, nine, you know, the short for Indiana was Indy. So a lot of people used to also call me Indy. So it was, it was oh, like all cool. these tie-ins, right? Yeah. But that opening scene where he is uh, trying to get the, to the Golden Idol and then heads on out of there and the famous big boulder rolling scene, yeah, that to me has been um, one of the scenes that I will always remember and the sound design involved with it, the long takes, no, you know, analyzing it now as an adult, but the long takes uh, building up to when he gets to the Golden Idol and then the quick cuts after and just the tension that you get from like, oh, what is happening? Is, this, is the boulder going to catch him and all this stuff? And then all these years later and looking at it and researching it and, you know, kind of uh, being inspired by it and knowing that, you know, Harrison Ford and, and if you go back and watch it, there's a moment where, you know, he slips and fall down, falls kind of, he doesn't fall down, but he kind of trips up. Yeah. That yeah. was like ramps up the tension. Right. But that was like the only time it happened in the multiple times that they did that take, you know, well that, oh, wow. that scene. So they, that's the take that they took because that felt more re- more intense yeah. right like him kind of falling to one knee like oh my god because you know like okay that boulder might might come at you yeah and um it looks real right that boulder wasn't real so it's, it's a foam ball although they estimating that it could have been ab- around 300 to 800 pounds wow. uh, because of the, the size of it but that scene is always going to be ingrained in my mind um and it was the opening scene so right off the rip it was like Boom, you you like into it. And that's what taught me to want to, whenever I do any film or uh, discuss ideas with fellow creatives and, and what they want to do, it's like you want to draw them in right at the beginning. That's my theory, yeah. too. You, uh, can, you, you can set the mood later, yeah. but like within my, the first few minutes, man. Those that that's That's become my philosophy now yeah. that... The opening of a film is what I call the plank times of that film's universe. You know, it's like after the Big Bang happened, you know, like they say that the the universe was in plank times. Things were happening so fast, and, you know. That's sort of my theory about cinema is like the first few minutes, that's like the Big Bang of the film. And Absolutely. Everything that's happening should convey the sort of film you're going to watch and the theme should be interjected in there yeah. somehow. Yeah. There's a lot of information that you, you, you need to show, you know, introduce your characters a little bit and all that. But if you draw people in to want to, like, stay put in their seat and focus all their attention, especially nowadays where focus is always all over the place, that's – you reel them in, you're good. Yeah. And for me, even back then, as a kid, watching – Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was that was it for me. I was like, oh, okay. This is- I love the scene where he's drinking shots with the other guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, th- like the the whole series of them were, you know, there's oh, there was the Temple of Doom. Like there was always they're something all great. Yeah, they were Even all when, great. The one with Sean Connery. It was yeah, it was absolutely. Dad, like you know, and and it wasn't. I actually, you know, I say they were all great. I didn't see the the the, newer the later ones. one, yeah, yeah, Crystal Skull, and Crystal all that. Skull. I mean, was I, there one after that? Was it just Crystal Skull? Or? I th- yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, Crystal Skull. Was I the didn't. Last yeah, one. did not catch that one. Yeah, the, was it was it okay? That was with uh, Shia. Oh yeah, yeah. Purists will tell you, yeah, no, nah, we we we're not going there, right? Uh, those who love Indiana Jones, they'll they'll stay in the early days. Yeah, um, but uh, I'm not such a purist. I just, you know, I yeah, I was, I was, you just like in good. love with yeah. with the the movies, and you know, a lot of the the big names behind the scenes, the um. The folks that, um, like, I think John Williams, he from Star he Wars, like, everybody, yeah, everybody yeah. came over from yeah, Star fantastic. Wars, yeah. So, yeah. they John Williams did the score, you had the the um, the production designers, like, everybody so Spielberg came. basically just stole yeah. George Lucas's crew. Well, well, George Lucas was the producer, right? Oh, there so, you go, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. He, he brought all of yeah. it, you know, because the studio at the time, I think I remember re- reading or seeing, um, Spielberg had done a movie that flopped. And so when uh, they talked about uh, Indiana Jones, they were the the studios were looking at George Lucas to say, "Hey, you know, I know y'all boys, but let's make sure he let's, gets it yeah, right because right. he was, you know." And this is remember, this is the early days, so yeah, you know, we know Steven Spielberg as one of the you know the goats, the greatest of all yeah. times, right? That, but that's literally how the executive said it too. I know you all, boys. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was a verbatim transcript, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. Yeah, but so, no, good paraphrasing. That's definitely uh, that's how it works. I mean, yeah. that's the, I can imagine those sort of conversations happening. You know, it's like, it's, hey, you guys better get it right this time. And it goes to show too, like, no matter what, like we we look at some of the great Scorsese, Kubrick. You know, a bunch of them. Alfred they, Hitchcock yeah, back in the day. When they started out, you know, they they some of them were flying off the seat of their pants too. Sure. You know, they learned on the fly. Hitchcock. Yeah. Is a good example. Of learned that on the fly. But, you know, it's funny too. It's like some of them have had like the Hitchcock way, the, you know, this way, you know, like the directors, right? S- oftentimes those were situations where it was plan Z. You know, yeah. they were like, we got to get something. Let's just do this. And it ends up being something so iconic that everybody then wants to duplicate right, in, for right. in other projects. Right. It's funny. So it's not like something I had planned. You know, yeah. I, I thought about this for years. And yeah. now it's like, oh, snap. I had to do this because it was late. It's in like the catching day. lightning in the yeah. bottle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely is. Absolutely is. So, so do you have another scene? That's a great example. Uh, another yeah. scene that you wanted to discuss? Yeah. One of the most iconic scenes for me, and this is more recent, uh, but although it's almost a decade now, was uh, Inception. Oh, great. Christopher fun. Nolan, the hallway dream fight scene. Fantastic. Um, with Jordan. Joseph I mean, Gordon-Levitt. Joseph, yeah, Joseph yeah. Gordon-Levitt. Like, this... Uh, great now, example. It, yeah, like, so, and knowing that Christopher Nolan, you know, he's he's a purist when it comes to, like, still wanting to do film and all that stuff. It's not very into CGI type stuff or whatever. So, you know, that scene was a, a practical scene in that they built this rotating set where the director of photography had to set up, you know, all of the the lights that were practicals in there or whatever. That had to be all set in place because it was going to be rotating. And I think it ended up being like, um. Six revolutions per minute, or something like that. I, I don't wow. remember what it was, but um, Joseph Gordon Levitt, you know, and again, this is like researching it after and watching it 50,000 times. Um, took two weeks to kind of acclimate himself to the feel of it rotating and being able to hit his marks at a certain time because when they slide into the, the room from off the hallway, which was like eight feet wide or something like that. There was, uh, it was a rectangle, and one was twenty five feet long. So, if 
and he was in there for most of it. That I mean, there was some handoffs to stunt uh, stuntmen a uh, couple times, but again, because of the way it was, they had to kind of do it mostly as a one take and all this stuff. And if he missed his mark, he could have potentially fell up to twenty five feet, which you yeah, you can die. Could be catastrophic. Yeah, you can die. So, you know, just obviously when seeing it the first time. Jaw is on the floor watching this happen, but the filmmaker in me is like, "How did they do this? How, how did, did they, they do, do this? Right. I gotta find out how did they yeah. do, do this, right?" And obviously, having a hundred and sixty million dollar budget helps. Yeah, but, but it's still a tricky thing to pull off. And you very, know, and Nolan planning. is is very precise. I said six revolutions yeah, per yeah, minute. Well, like it's got to be like you know, and and it was precise. like it, it was a planning thing because they did have to, you know, as much as he wanted to. Um, he knew what he wanted to show, but then, you know, for safety reasons or whatever, they had to make sure that they, they knew the exact um, amount of revolutions. And, and the I remember seeing in the room scene, they actually had to ramp it because on the shorter side, then they could slow it. But then on the longer side, they had to speed it up so that it, it, it kind of turns over quickly so that um, there's no long periods of this space where the actors have potential to to go further distances if they if they miss their mark and they quote unquote fell, so I mean just that that scene itself and you know I got super technical with it but watching it and the action transpiring, I was totally hypnotized by it. Yeah, I, and many people were because I was that was <laughs> just floored by everything that was going on. When no the pun truck, intended. No pun intended. You know, intended. just the dream within a dream within a dream. Yeah, and that simultaneously. Um, what's going on in the deepest layer of the dream, which is the truck going off the ledge and oh, then yeah, they're in yeah. the truck yeah. and then that's going in the slowest amount of time. And yeah. that was just so intense yeah. that I just remember watching that movie. I'm like, wow, Nolan has raised the cinematic bar. Right. <laughs> He's just raised the bar. Yep. And again, this is one of those things where even Nolan, you know, who at this point has a name, you know, behind him, he he has a resume to prove it because his story was one that did not come with, you know, intellectual property. So it wasn't something that was already built right. into fans. Well, this was like his own story. Right. The studio was a little hesitant, you know, and that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, we see now, like the MCU has already dominated you know, planned out for the next five years you know whatever yeah. and it has that established ip but to have an original idea and to get uh, a lot of money to to show it is, is is challenging even for christopher nolan so and he is one of my you know directors that i i, I appreciate um he's outstanding yeah and i'm not a i'm a filmmaker but i've never used film that i didn't come into the to the space when you know um i didn't never had my hands on anything film even 16 mil um which is unfortunate but it's okay you I'm know the same way i yeah. came from the digital era yeah yeah as, um, as but as i definitely I. respect you know yeah proper filmmakers yeah now photography i remember you know the 110s and the 35 mils but not for for movies and and Back then, too, it, was, it wasn't something that we could get a Canon. Well, that that's uh, the thing. It's the, it's the barrier of entry. As yeah, much as, absolutely. you know, people that only have shot on film, they might be able to thumb their nose and be like, oh, well, you know, digital, that doesn't count. For us, especially coming from the Bronx and things like that, digital enabled us to be able to do this. Otherwise, we would not have had... Um, the money there would have been too much of a barrier of entry to, to do it. I always say that the the digital camera did for the filmmaker what the pen once did for the pen and paper once did for the writer. Yes, it absolutely. It enabled us. I love yeah, I love that quote. It. Yeah, I remember you uh, telling telling that in the Bronx Focus, and it, and it's so true. And I mean, for us being Bronxites, the closest we would ever come to to getting our hands on that it, it, at least when we were coming up is the nyu tish route and as we know it, it's not easy to get in there it's, it's 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 a long uphill battle 
And honestly, for me, uh, although I had aspirations of being a filmmaker as a young kid, that was like totally dismantled by, you know, a West Indian dad who thought filmmaking was not like what you were supposed to do. Uh, didn't make money, you know, just kind of, um, those assumptions and, you know, it's all good, but, you know, yeah, being, going to, to business school kind of <laughs> sounded a little better than being a filmmaker, uh, for a lot of, for a sure, lot of parents. Same, so. same here, man. Yeah. I went to, uh, Pace yeah. for business, you know, right. because even though I was interested in film when I was younger and I'd even taken classes at the school of visual arts, uh, when I was in high school on the weekends, you know, I, you know, just coming from, you know, just being a first generation Albanian kid, you know, and having, uh, you know, just, it just seemed like filmmaking wasn't for us. You know, nobody had said, overtly said that to me, but it just, it seemed like a pipe dream at the time. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I was trying to, I guess, think more practically. And then I ended up, you know, doing other things and then getting sort of back into it later on when I said, Hey, you know, life is too short to not do what you love to do. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I spent almost a decade in an industry that was my other passion in, in music, you know, growing up in the Bronx, right? Hip hop everywhere. Uh, but I worked in a mechanical rights agency, which, you know, there's no <laughs> physical product anymore, no DVDs or anything like that. But after having gone through the music industry, then it was like, all right, let me try to get into my passion and in filmmaking and that was via the route of being a uh, cast member on a sports reality show and then doing, you know, sports. What was the show? It was Yes's Ultimate Road Trip. It was on the Yes Network. Yeah. Uh, six diehard Yankee fans traveling the country, competing in physical and mental challenges to win tickets to Yankee games. And when was this? What era? 2007. 2007. So yeah. I played high school ball where the new stadium is. Yeah. <laughs> so th that was my opportunity. Yeah. And I knew like I wanted to transition because at the point at that point, um, it was Apple coming in and kind of taking a very big shovel to the head of the music industry and, you know, saying we have this thing called the iPod and now it's digital. So I kind of knew I wanted to, to head out anyway, and um, that show was my, it was for six months, because six months is, is the entire season of, uh, of baseball, so it was my opportunity to say to the crew, like, hey, I've always had a passion in, in uh, filmmaking and, you know, and cameras, uh, do you mind if I go out and learn from you guys when you're not filming me? And so that became my quote unquote film school. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, that's a cool story. Yeah. And you know, here we are now and um still learning, still trying It's a lifetime of learning, my absolutely. friend. That's absolutely. That's how I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's good when you have folks like you, uh, to to be able to help along the way, you know, and um we've had plenty of conversations about the struggles the journey the uh the good the bad the ugly Absolutely. and that's what it is you know likewise and, brother but it's fun it's an art you know and and uh we've supported each other and and for many years now and, and we'll it's, continue it's, to yeah, do so absolutely and, and obviously it's one of those things here you know uh we both have a podcast now yeah we, we you know we kind of working it through yeah. and shout out to indios podcast scene and take yes yes thank you um so yeah and listen you know, and subscribe yeah and the same you know film scene you gotta you gotta you gotta be down on both on both absolutely thank you brother for being on the podcast yeah Appreciate man you. no problem no 